Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs, and currently I'm teaching entrepreneurship at Vinh University in Hanoi, Vietnam. Today's guest is Jerry Rosegarten, author of Jump on the Train. Jerry, welcome. My pleasure. So, uh, Jerry, let's start off with you giving us a little bit about your professional background. Then I know we're going to dig deep into it. But, like, how did you kind of arrive where you're at now? And then we'll go into all the many businesses that you've gotten into and what you've learned along the way. I have a philosophy, which is the title of the book, which is Jump on the Train. If I see something I like, I'll jump on the train and take it to the end. I always have to take it to the end because I'm very stubborn. So I do take it to the end. Sometimes it's very profitable. Sometimes it's a little profitable. Sometimes it was just wrong. But, and and I liked, uh, I, I wanted to know why you picked out that title for the book. And I'm assuming because you're a New Yorker that it's a metaphor uh, from looking at the cover of the book uh, of the New York transit system. It's, it, it's a metaphor of trains, but New York is where I've been all my life. So that's that train. Um, the uh, Most of what I've done has been in New York. Just some things on the island, some things in Jersey, but basically the bulk of it has been in New York. And why did you write this book? It was during COVID. Um, my wife had written a short story about, a memoir, a short story about a, her trip with a friend. And she looked at me and said, you should write a short story. I said, no, I'm going to write a book. Uh -huh. you, have to, you have to understand that I'm dyslexic and basically couldn't read until I was 50. All right? So uh, for me to sit down and write a book is <laughs> miraculous, amazing. I don't know. I, I don't know the adjective you would use for it, but it's um, it was not easy, especially at the beginning. So, well, what is dyslexia for people who don't really know what it is? I mean, they hear it. I uh, Supposedly, Muhammad Ali, Ali was dyslexic. Lots of famous people were. What exactly is dyslexia? Okay. So, first of all, there are different forms of dyslexia. The most common described dyslexia is reversing the word. So, you see it backwards. And it's, you know, and... and that's the most basic form. There are other things where people look at a page of print and there are snakes running down the page. That's a form of dyslexia. There, for me, the actual page ate up the letters. The white of the page slowly just ate up the letters. And I couldn't catch up. <laughs> so now I didn't find out until I was... Um, about 50. And it's in the book. You know, it's this, and as a matter of fact, the last chapter of the book um, describes dyslexia. It describes a solution for some dyslexics um, and, and a place that they can go get help. And like I did, I saw the first time I ever saw a printed page, actually saw it like you see it, right, was... Uh, when I was 50, it was on uh, 60 Minutes. A uh, woman was there and they were talking uh, about dyslexia and this gentleman was reading, fumfering like I would read, right? And I stopped, I was at a, a cocktail party, I walked over and listened to him read and listened to the segment. Then I got this woman who was the um, who discovered it. Her name is Helen Erlin. Um, I got her into my office uh, under a pretense of renting her space in a medical building I was building, and um, 
I saw a page for the first time. And and so you weren't diagnosed until you were in your 40s or 50s? No one. First of all, when I when I you have to understand something. I'm older than I look. And as you said, and the fact of the matter is that they didn't know about dyslexia when I went to school. In other words, it was not a known thing. So, or if it was known, it was known at a very high level, not a low level, like where I was in school. And um, I was just dumb, not trying hard enough, not working. Uh, those were the adjectives that were used against me. <laughs> so is there any positives to being dyslexic? Because if you talk to someone blind, They'll tell you their sense of smell and hearing is heightened because they uh, can't see. Is there any positives to being dyslexic? Well, I would have to say from my career, uh, which I base on the fact that I start things that uh, no one sees. I see it. And that's when I run with it. Um, you know I created a leisure suit. Yeah. Okay? Which is now a joke. But the fact of the matter is, at the time, it was a gangbuster hit. Right? I remember wearing them. I was, I'm 63, so I remember wearing one to my bar mitzvah. So you don't look 63. Oh, so, thank you. So the, the, the reality of it is it, it became a very, very big thing. And I started that. I mean, I... Uh, there's a whole segment in the book on how that came about. Um, other things that I've created, like, first of all, law, you know, it's a, it's a matter of seeing what's not there and then filling in the gap. And when, when I say filling in the gap, I mean making sure there's a market. So your mind looks and sees something that no one is doing. You do it but you know that you're doing it for a market. Now, you may be wrong, but that's 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 what I've done over the years. And uh, seeing something that's out there is kind of like getting on the train and running with the train. Uh, how do you get your ideas? Because I'm a serial entrepreneur myself and, and I've done over 28 ventures, and I get my ideas just from observation um, or reading stuff. How do you get your ideas? Well, it definitely wasn't reading stuff, but it was it yeah. it's it, it definitely came from uh, as I said, seeing it. You know, you go around the city, you can see where there are properties that are uh, neglected, and you can see where there is um, uh, vacancies. You can see an area that 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 has not been touched, but the market is moving in that direction. So you you jump on that train. Uh, you mentioned as an adult you were diagnosed as a manic depressive. Uh, what is that, and how did that impact you professionally and personally? Okay, that was not as an adult. That was as a child. So it goes back a long, long time. Uh, as far as how did it affect me, I think it's I think it's part of me. You know, it's part of what makes me uh, who I am. You know, you can't not deal with it. I think it started with diet pills when I was a kid and stuff like that. But basically, it's what I am. Uh, and I think it's actually been part of my success. Because it's, it, it's, it's always made me drive harder. Especially with knowing it. Well, what drew you to the clothing industry in the beginning? You, even as a teenager, you were working in the clothing industry. What what drew you to that? I saw in my um, childhood a, a, a reality that women dressed and men didn't. You would go to a uh, party or whatever the case would be, the men would be in black. <laughs> And the women would be in all sorts of colors and stuff like that. 
the first store that I, so then I got a job in high school in a men's clothing store, which was an avant-garde clothing store. I mean, it was really, it was uh, primarily for um, musicians and uh, from musicians to mobsters, but that kind of like dress. And um, then I got a job in another clothing store at the same time, different days of the week, okay? Uh, and that was a very staid store. I mean, you know, bankers and uh, uh, bar mitzvah suits and stuff like that. And I guess it came to me at one point that each of them wanted to be more like the other. And that's what de developed the leisure suit. It felt that men were bound in these black suits and they would never go to the extreme of, uh, you know, the mobster dress. So between the two, I found that. Yeah, I, and I always wondered why it never recycled again, because most every type of um, clothing, uh, fashion recycles itself again at some point. But the leisure suit, uh, which is like 50 years ago now, has never recycled. Well, first of all, I don't agree with that. It has recycled um, as far as what a leisure suit was. A leisure suit was based upon a fabric. And what it was was a fabric that would move with you and was, um, and that you didn't have shoulder pads. So that it was very casual. Now, there are, you know, there were safari type looking, there were Nehru type looking, but basically, the leisure suit was a was this fabric, and if you go into men's stores today, very high end, by the way, men's stores, right, designer men's stores, you'll see that fabric. I think when people think of the leisure suit, they don't think of the fabric itself; they think of the look. Well, the look the look was, uh, you know, when I when I made my, <laughs> I made the first garment, right. It was a leisure yeah. suit, and it was copied and copied and copied. Um, it has not come back. <laughs> yeah, not, I mean, I happened? didn't think about the fabric, and when I thought about the leisure uh, suit, I think, and if you ask anybody, they're not necessarily thinking about the fabric. I mean, maybe your industry does, but the uh, average person thinks about that style in particular. That style without the um, fabric would be nothing. But okay, I understand, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, at a very young age, uh, in one of the stores you were working at, a gentleman named Elliot wanted to make you a partner in the business. And uh, I think that sounds like a great compliment to me based on your age and experience. Why did he want to make you a partner? And why did you say decide not to do that? Um. <laughs> Actually, Abe was the one who wanted me to make me a partner. Elliot was the other partner. Aha. Uh -huh. And Abe wanted to get away from Elliot. And I looked at it from a standpoint of um, having to work with Elliot and to limit myself to that one store. And I decided that was not for me. I couldn't do it. First of all, I don't think I could take on the responsibility of the payback. Even though, even though he said um, he would be very lenient with that. So that's why I didn't do it. That's why I went into wholesale and everything else out there. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, you mentioned the book that about your brother and you being partners, and you have a bunch of other partners in different ventures. But you and your brother were partners. What was your experience like working with a family member, and what were the positives and the challenges of working with a family member, especially when you were so close with your brother? How it was the uh, sane one. How it you know would. Uh... I'd bring a, a project, we would be looking at a project, and he would say, no, we can't do it because this, this, and this. And I would say, first of all, I was the one who did the projects. He had an immigration 
practice, and he was tied up in that all the time. But he always put in his two cents into the projects, or whatever it was worth. And he just said, um, we would fight like cats and dogs, just like brothers. Mm -hmm. And we would come to conclusions, and then fight like cats and dogs again. <laughs> On every on every item, there was there was two cents by him and two cents by me. Uh, opposites, two, uh, the opposite two cents. But you were probably more of the risk taker, and he was probably more of the conservative. So it kind of balanced itself out. Yeah, I would say that's true. That's true. And, and what were the positives of working with a family member like your brother? Well, I could trust him. It's different. Um, I mean, I control most of the projects that I've done. In fact, all the projects that I've done, with maybe a few exceptions. The exceptions did not work out. And you never know why they didn't work out if you're not, if you're not responsible for them, okay? But um, I learned early on that I have to control what I'm doing. That doesn't mean... I don't have a team that helps me make the decisions, but basically I have to control what I do. So uh, the answer is uh, basically we can trust one another that we're doing we're doing the best thing for the project and for and for us. I have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this show, and you write about how to read the wolf in sheep's clothing, a description of someone looking harmless, but is quite dangerous. How do you size people up and determine if they're trustworthy or not? And what are some of the tells you look for? Some, uh, first of all, it's visceral. You can sense some people right out, right out of the gate. And you, 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 you don't do business with them. Uh, the people you do business with, and you see the, the flaws as you go along. Again, if you control the project, you control those flaws. So the basic thing is control. And I'm not, I, I, you know, people say I'm a control freak and all this other stuff, which may be true, which may be true. But it's, it's protected me over the years. And um, be as thoughtful of, of your partners as you can be. Because the, the decisions they make, or the decisions you make, affect them. So you have to look at it and say, you, you got to look at a partner as being you. And, and you know. And they they have to hear that, see that, or whatever, and, and respect it. Uh, what skills do you need to be a great salesperson? And are salespeople born, or can anyone develop the skill to be actually not just okay at it, but great at it? Okay. Um, obviously, I don't consider myself a great salesperson. What I consider myself is a great actor. I studied um, acting uh, for a lot of years. And the thing I like most in acting is improv. So when you can do improv, which means that you are able to act in the moment with the person you're acting with, right? Um, that gives you the ability to convince which is selling. So I don't know. I don't know how to sell. I know how to get someone involved and convince them that this is something they should do. Or something do they should buy. That, do you think you convince them, or do people sell themselves on something that they want? But you're a good consultant at listening to them and giving them the answers uh, that they're looking for. Okay, first of all, I, 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 I don't give answers that they're looking for. 
I give the answers. And if the, and if that works for them, then that's great. Um, in selling someone, the improv, in an improv, someone wins and someone loses the argument, whatever the argument is, okay? So that gives me that. Uh, not all improvs are not real. They're just they're just conversation that comes from you that can be real. So when you say acting, you say improv yourself, you think, okay, you're 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 pulling a bull out of yourself, right? That you're not telling the truth. It doesn't have to be that way. First of all, it can't be that way if you're selling something because the product you're selling is 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 a product or something a project you know so you can't just make up it out of whole cloth um do you think uh sales people should anybody who's going in the sales should take acting lessons yeah i i actually uh, anybody i don't i don't care who it is acting lessons um teach you how to relate it helps you communicate and whether you're a banker a accountant or a salesperson the, the key is to communicate you may not win every argument but at least the person knows what you want you wanted or or um we're offering is there a favorite actor of yours that you kind of modeled how you deliver uh communication The first time that's ever been asked, and I don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of actors. There are a lot of actors out there that, um, I mean, you know, I don't mimic them, if that's what you, you're saying. No, but I was thinking their style, the way they do it, you know, that you might take a look at it. I come from a different era. So the era that I would say, uh, the one I like the most is Paul Newman. Paul Newman was a uh, very subtle actor in his own way, but he'd also, you know, he could be he could be harsh. But his most of his acting, the way I remember it, was um, pretty straight and so subtle. So I think that's who I would pick, and that's the first time I ever thought about that. So <laughs> I need more time to think. But that's okay. No, I, I think that's a good choice. Uh, why do you think you connected with people so easily? And how did you develop that skill? I developed it. I care about people. I mean, I, 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 I care about people. So I'm dealing, when you care about people, you listen more than you talk and you um many times when you're talking to someone they'll tell you their problems they'll tell you what's going on in their life they'll tell you things that you know you wouldn't you know like even to, like a priest would get and that's kind of um i guess ingratiating to someone who's who's telling you their secrets their their feelings yeah, there's a huge trust factor. Yeah. Uh, why did you focus on men's clothing when women and when men don't spend nearly as much as women? Because I knew men's clothing. <laughs> I grew up with men's clothing in high school, uh, junior high school. I worked in these men's stores. I knew nothing about it, and I still know nothing about women's. I mean, I appreciate women's. Uh, I appreciate style, but um, that wasn't where my bread was buttered. Uh, young people that might be listening to this interview, you talk about that you used to tell your customer negative stories about your boss, 
And looking back, do you think that was smart? And what would you coach young people today to do uh, if, if they like the industry they're in, but they hate their boss? Well, first of all, I regret telling um, my customers about my boss. I don't regret it from a standpoint of the outcome, because the outcome was very good for me. And my boss was horrible. <laughs> that, that boss was horrible. Um, all I can say is get away from a horrible boss. Don't well, talk well, about what, it. Run from it. What's your, what's your criteria of a good boss and how? what was your leadership style when you're running your organizations? Same thing as about, the um, same, same answer as before. Care about your people. A boss cares about you. He'll he'll do things that shows that. You know, don't expect uh, him to bend over backwards, but you know he'll care for you and he'll take care of you. And that's what uh, you take on a responsibility when you become a boss. Just take on a responsibility, and that responsibility weighs very heavily on you. When business is bad, when things aren't the way they should be, because you understand that these people are all depending on you. They don't know that necessarily, but you know it. No doubt that they are depending on you because th this is how they're making their living, paying their mortgages and sending their kids to college and all, all of those things. And if you're providing retirement funding, they're so dependent on you, right? Yeah. I mean, well, no, first of all, the majority of people work for people. I could never work for someone. I, I mean, it just wasn't in me. I couldn't, I couldn't perform for them, for the company. I just, I, it just didn't work. And I tried. Even, uh, once or twice. Was what, what was the what was the experience like when you left Burlington and you formed your own company? Um, fear, um, excitement. Um, I think those are the two <laughs> that were involved with that. What What was the fear part? No, I was going into something I never did before. I was, I, I was starting a company, starting a company under uh, that I controlled, that I um, uh, and I didn't have money and I didn't have uh, the background, the education. So that was a fear. I, and I couldn't recall in the book, uh, but were you married and with and had a family at that point? I think I just got married um maybe a year after that but I, I but i could have been i could have been dating and whatever and, and planning to marry um i don't remember uh, but it was right right around that period well, what made you leave the clothing industry the clothing industry It started to go to uh, Japan. Everything was, first of all, let me explain when you say clothing industry. I was in the fabric business. I, I wasn't in the clothing business. I would sell to the manufacturers of clothing and um, design fabrics for them, right? That for me was the clothing business. What happened First of all, everyone knows what happened to the leisure suit, so that fell off the cliff. And I uh, had a pretty decent overhead at that point, and I knew it was falling off the cliff, and I was planning for it. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was doing some other fabric, other type of fabric, but I wasn't able to keep it. So I, so I closed Brook Industries. Um, the um, uh, Japanese were moving in and making the fabrics. 
So I saw the handwriting on the wall and I got out of the industry. So you went into the restaurant business, uh, which has one of the highest failure rates. Well, why did you do that? Wait, just before, not then. Before I went into the restaurant business, I went into the loft business. Yeah, the mini storage? No, that's another business much further down the way. I went into the loft business, which was not being, uh, that was one of the things, seeing something that wasn't being, that wasn't seen. That was making lofts. I made the first lofts, legal lofts in Manhattan. Uh, and that was, that was the business I went into right after the textile. What, why did you go into that business? I saw it as a big business. I saw it as a, I had a house. The only thing I got from the textile business was a very nice house. Okay. Um, I saw this whole thing coming about with lofts, with people, regular people moving into lofts. They weren't moving into lofts then. Artists were moving into lofts. So I said, I should buy some of those. I could, I could make seventeen units, eighteen units in a in a building which would be great units. Because I saw that I saw lofts as being great space. And um, I ended up selling my house to buy my first loft building. Took my family. At that time, I was married and had two kids. One kid, two kids. <laughs> and we moved, I moved them in to a rental house uh, with an option to buy. Because real estate was really not strong then. And then I started to develop loft buildings. And then I made money from that. That was my next business. Now, getting to restaurants, um, I made a loft medical building. And the bottom of that building had a retail space that I eventually... Uh, became a restaurant for me. So it wasn't it wasn't going into the restaurant business with all the failure. It was going into restaurant building as the landlord um, trying to make it work, right? I have a step up if I'm the landlord. Because yes. Not it was a coffee shop, I think, originally. No, that was that was the first one. That was the first one. That was a, that was a whole only chapter in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but what did you learn from that experience of getting into one of the literally one of the hardest businesses you could get into? That I liked it a lot. It brought why out, so? Because it brought out my showmanship. In a, in a in a you know, when you build a building, you're building a building. So you design it, that's very nice. But that's not showmanship. You want to draw people to you, then it's showmanship. And uh, I would do great Halloween uh, parties in the place. I put a, a, you know, a cow. You know the story about the cow? I put the cow in front of the store, and it was a big hit. Kids would always sit on them and they take pictures and so forth. It was, and then I took away the cow. And I took away the cow and brought it to, I think it was three or four places in the city, like Grand Central Station and um, 42nd Street and uh, Wall Street. But it was written up like it was stolen, the cow. And all the all the neighbors, you know, were really upset about losing the cow. So eventually, we brought the cow back, and everybody was happy. But I mean, that's that's what I mean by showmanship. You 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 you, you play with it, and it's the type of business that appreciates that. I mean, you know, it's okay to have good food and all this stuff. We had the best. Burger in the city, 
we had a thing called a marshmallow shake, which Michael Simon came in and put on the map. Just put it on the map. He ran a, um, his show was the best thing I ever ate. And he wrote this as the best dessert he ever ate. And he ran it for like nine months. Wow. 20, 20 minutes. People would come in, you know, obviously we have a lot of New Yorkers. People from all over the country would be coming in asking for the marshmallow shake. I've never yeah. had a marshmallow shake. So now I'm thinking that's something I've got to try. Now, what I did with the marshmallow shake was I did a charity at um, Lincoln Center, which was for cancer. And we had a booth because we'd always take these, have booths at these different charities. And we had marshmallow shakes. And then the guy next to me was a, was a liquor bar. So I asked him if he could give me a bottle of vodka. And I start, put a, a shot of vodka in the marshmallow shake. And that became stiff shakes. And and the line for that was outrageous. <laughs> so it's just these are things you play with. And and you know, not all business has to be money, and not all business has to be uh, you know, you can have fun with these. You should enjoy what you're doing. Uh, and I was going to ask you, what's your criteria for picking the businesses that you get into? First, I, I says before, I see something that's not there. It's not being done. And that I could do. And there's a market for it. So the, the, the trick is to come up with something that is... Uh, that first of all, there's a demand for, and that you're not really copying anybody with it. Knocking off or copying things, that's kind of easy. You know, there's a market. Now you, now it's only a matter of timing because, you know, businesses go, time, times affect business. Um, yeah, I would say that's... You also you got into the mini storage business. I also got into that. I was an investor. That turned out to be a pretty good investment to make uh, to be in. Yeah. Why did you get into the mini storage business? And what did you learn from being in that business? Well, my brother got me into that business. Um. It's a long story of how he got me in, but he got me into that business. We and we have the business still. And my brother's passed, and his children got a mini storage business. I don't have it anymore. What made you go into solar farming, and can you make money in that business? And I read all about Mary and. Uh, this woman who made it very difficult for you to um, successfully enter that business. And what did you learn about uh, local politics from that? Okay. First of all, I became an, um, an environmentalist. Not in the same like I'm cr you know, crazy about doing these things or whatever, uh, but, but basically saying, hey, we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves. You know, we, we're not going to take care of our kids. First, I said, "Not my." We're not going to take care of our kids. Now, I don't think we're necessarily taking care of ourselves because it's moving faster than I ever thought. But um, my wife came home with a yellow tag, and that yellow tag said, "Do not let your dogs or children play on the ground." Of course, they put pesticides on the ground, which then goes through to the inf you know the uh, aquifer and affects the environment. My wife came in very upset about that, and this is the first time I really thought about the environment. And I was building a house, and I decided to make it the first greenhouse in uh, 
Southampton. I mean, it, uh, you know, I live in the house, so it's that's one of the things. But I did, I didn't plan on living. I plan on selling it, but that never happened. Um, so, and it was great, and it is a great house. So I said I should build. I had a hundred acres with partners, and I said let's build houses, greenhouses on this uh, acreage. 400 houses, 300 houses, something like that within the, within the spans. And I ran into Mary. And Mary was impossible. She had her own agenda. She was she had a group. And you know the term NIMBY. Do you know the term NIMBY? No. Not in my backyard. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. And basically, that was her. So she fought me on the housing. Because the, the, the land was not zoned for residential, it was zoned for commercial. And I said, okay. I said, okay. I didn't say okay. <laughs> I was not happy at all. But anyhow, I left with my tail between my legs and just let it go and said, oh, okay, I'm not going to do, I can't do housing. And then I decided to do solar. I saw a solar farm in Italy that I thought was amazing. It was it had um, vegetables growing underneath it, so it wasn't just a solar farm. It was a solar farm farm. And uh, this was in Italy. And then I decided to do that here. I had the right zoning wise, so I started to do it. And then I got kicked in the head by Mary. And then she got Politico on her side. And before I know it, they're looking to take my land. Governor Cuomo looked at this and said no. And he, he vetoed a bill that they had to take my land. And we ended up building the solar farm. In answer to the question, is the solar farm profitable? Solar farm is profitable. We have a, a, a lease with um, LIPA for another, I guess, another 15 years or so, where they're buying the energy. And the and land is incre increasing in value. So you can't hurt with that. You had an experience being first in a new business where the region... Uh, you were opening, uh, didn't have a lot of knowledge. What's your thoughts about being first and what did you learn from that? Well, are you, are you talking about a specific one? Yeah, I, I, and I think it relates more or less to uh, <clears throat> the solar business that you got into. You, you were saying in the book, hey, I was the first uh, to go and do this and, it, and I took all the arrows for it. I think yeah. it was that particular business. Yeah. What, all... what did you learn about being first? Because I've been first in lots of areas. And I thought to myself uh, that I ended up spending a lot of money educating the market. And then other people were able to come in. And if you take a look at the winners in history, none of them were first. Uh, I have an ego thing about being. No, I, you know, it, it, it... What I said before is I see things that aren't there. So seeing something that's not there, you, um, you're going to be first if you do it. Um, so there's a plus and minus to being first. First of all, that you have um, demand for something that's not there and you bring it out and you have no competition initially. So that's one of the reasons to be first. The solar, the, the uh, greenhouse that I built, which was the first uh, in Southampton Village, I paid through the nose. I didn't make any money. I got another one for you after this. I didn't make any money, but I built a greenhouse, so somebody should learn how to build a greenhouse. I actually try to get builders in here to teach them how to, because it's it was, 
It should have been an educational thing too. Um, but that really didn't happen. And that led to the solar farm. So, you know, these things happen. Um, the, the other one that I did, my parents moved down to Florida. And they moved into a community. First, they bought it before it was built. And they moved into a community of, you know, 50 and older or whatever you want to call it, but uh, senior citizens community. Um, and the developer built, eventually built about 800 homes. They weren't homes. They were kind of like track. They were two-story apartments. So I had two stories of apartments, 25 on the floor, 25 on the floor, and then another one like that, another one like that, and so forth. My mother came to me whether she should buy it, and I said, you should buy it. And then she said, should I live upstairs or downstairs? I said, Ma, you've been under, you know, she was in a, we were in a two, um, two bedroom, one bath apartment, five of us. I said, Ma, you've been living under someone for all these years. You should buy on the top. Don't have anybody above me anymore. So that's what we did. Then years pass, and a lot of years pass, and then her knees start to bother her. So she finds it hard to make the steps from the first floor to the second floor. So I said to my brother, let's build, and, and this is now, you know, not there. So I said, let's build an elevator. Got a lot of aggravation. I ended up ending up in front of 1,500 people. That's all I could fit in a theater where I was finally, that's after going after. This is two years to try and sell a lift. And I said one thing that sold the lift. Because I went from an elevator to a, to a lift because that would be more affordable for these people. Because my father kept on saying they wouldn't do it, they wouldn't do it. The um, management said well, they won't do it, they won't do it. So they ended up doing it. And the comment that I made in that theater was, you're not giving your neighbors lift. You're giving them a spare tire. Yeah. How can you not give them a spare tire? And that was it. Passed by a lot. And now, and now there are 800 lifts in Kings Point. That's the name of the place. And I didn't make a penny from it. And the annoyance is that I did a lift for $18,000. Management did the lift for twenty-four thousand dollars, but there was no no way of fighting management. No, the politics is too great. Yeah, um, talk about talk about the Rainbow Reader Kit and your experience trying out for Shark Tank and what you learned from that. Oh, that was. <laughs> um, I never got on Shark Tank. I, I I I was actually second in line of the first show or the first audition for for Shark Tank. Uh, I didn't know that Shark Tank was a profitable thing, meaning that they want the businesses for profit. Because the Rainbow Reader, I wasn't doing for profit. I wanted to get that out to schools and so forth, which I, which it's never happened. Um, so the kids, 20% of the dyslexics, would benefit from it. And in Shark Tank, you go before one, uh, one person. I don't know. There's a table of X number of people. You go before one. Get past that one, they'll put you to the next. And if you get past that one, they'll put you to the next. So I got to the point where I was presenting it to a camera 
right? Um, but I was presenting it as this, I guess, charitable thing. I, I mean, I, I I may have really screwed up the <laughs> the audition, but I you know what I said it. So it was just a charitable thing, and, uh, and they passed, and that was it. Yeah. And I, I made a mistake because um, I had something. Else. It... Go ahead. No, that's right. Go ahead. Finish what you were going to say. I had something else in my pocket that I could have made a fortune from, but I, I didn't bring it out. I wanted to get out the, the charitable thing. It was a um, overlay for the uh, iPhone. At the time the iPhone came out. It had the flat screen, and no one liked the flat screen. People were carrying Blackberries and iPhones together because they needed to type. So I had made this overlay with keys. You could see through the whole thing, an invisible overlay with the um, different keys. And I patented it. And I should have shown it to the Shark Tank because that would have been a winner. You're probably right about that. That one thing would have gotten excited about, especially Mark Cuban, who has the technology background. Right. But no, this was this um, was at the beginning of the iPhone. So it was everybody was complaining and then. But Steve Jobs is right and everybody got used to it. The flat screen. Um with your family, and you had so many different ventures, and you're still, I think, doing business. Um, how did you manage any kind of work-life balance? I mean, that's a big thing to people today is managing. Even entrepreneurs want to have some kind of work-life balance. How did you manage that, or is that, or is that almost an impossibility when you're an entrepreneur? First of all, when you're an entrepreneur, uh, you work 24-7. When I say you work, your mind is always on what's happening. You can't, you you cannot walk away from um, a problem. You have to think about that problem, and, and you'll continue to think about it until you solve it. See, I think that uh, all business people are problem solvers. You can't be in business and not be a problem solver. So, in answer to the question about you try to live as normal a life as you can. Um, the only thing that stops it from being normal uh, are problems. You know, it could be a nine to five job, but you have your head on all the uh, for, for 24 hours. You know what I'm saying? So you can be an entrepreneur and have a family and have a whole social life. That's no reason why you can't do that. It's just, it's different when you go someplace because you're looking around for things. Uh, you're always searching, your head is always turning. And, you know, but that doesn't take away from the fact that you're with your family. Well, where, where do you see the opportunities now? What do you think uh, people should be focusing on? What do you think are the best business opportunities right now? Everybody says AI. Um, I think we have to be very careful with that. Very careful. Because um, that literally can change uh, the back room of offices, uh, lifestyles. It, it, lifestyles, because if we do that and we lose the need for labor, then we have bigger problems in this country. Um, part of it I see in uh, buildings, in, in major locations which are vacant, 
which you're going through, have to go through you know, some sort of change. Someone's got to come up with the ideas of what can go into these buildings. And, it, and, and, and government has to get involved in it because there's too much money involved. And government can get involved with it by controlling banks. There's just too much money that's sitting out there on a property that was earning money and is not, you know, now they can't pay the debt service. Um, that's one of the major things. And, they, you know, all I can think about is health in schools. There's got to be other things, too. Jerry, I want to uh, thank you so much for taking the time to allow me to interview you. I really enjoyed the book. Certainly, I think you should be uh, lecturing at universities and mentoring more young people about entrepreneurship because of your vast and uh, different experiences. How do I do that? That's a new realm, new train. Uh, I think you contact the local universities and offer the entrepreneurship professors to come in and talk about your experience and offer to uh, mentor if they have a um, uh, if they have a uh, like a business launch center there. So yeah. I think you could be very valuable to young people coaching them. Thank you. I hope. I, I by the way, I'd be more than willing to do that. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. I, I thank you for talking to me.